All right, so I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence, what, what it is, uh, and also why it's important that you understand what it is because it's going to affect your lives uh, in, in, sort of in the future. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story also behind the scenes uh, of why it's growing so fast. And this is for kids, but it's also for grown-ups, all right? So this is uh, really, uh, it's a game changer, as we call it. It's something that's really going to have profound implications to almost anything you do. So uh, the, one of the, the challenges of artificial intelligence is that most of us, when we think about robotics and robots and AI, I think about these. You recognize these, these guys? Yeah? Right. That's right. So these are when we, when, so movies in Hollywood have sort of created this perception in our mind that this is what robots uh, and artificial intelligence looks like. These are smart machines. Maybe uh, there, there's lots of other movies that show robots that sometimes, sometimes uh, are happy, sometimes are not happy, sometimes they're sad, sometimes have complex relationship with themselves. There's all kinds of uh, robots that Hollywood depicts, but in reality, artificial intelligence looks like this. Like nothing. It's transparent. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't touch it. It's everywhere, it's like air, but you can't see it. And it's really governing a lot of aspects of our lives. So if you think, uh, if you hear, uh, you know, if you uh, listen to the news and you hear about the hurricane that's moving around and everybody's wondering where it's gonna go, it's all behind the scenes. It's artificial intelligence that's driving those predictions. There's artificial intelligence that's predicting the value of money in stock market and commodities every day. There's AI that's predicting what music you're going to listen to next so that the music uh, that's on your phone is going to uh, be ready. There's also uh, AI that's trying to predict what you're gonna buy and what gifts you're gonna want. And, uh, and everything that's behind the scenes is happening all the time. Even if you're applying for high school or middle school, there are AI programs that grade your test. So, so all of this is happening behind the scenes. You don't see it, you're just using your apps, you're using your phone, you're doing things. But there are AI systems that are doing this all the time. It's everywhere and it's affecting your life. When you look at ro robots, it's the same thing. So most robots are hidden. We can't see them. They are behind the scenes, they're in factories, they're working 24 seven, but we can't really see them doing anything. And the robots that make it to our lives are fairly simple. These are uh, vacuum cleaning robots. Anybody have a, a Roomba at home, a vacuum cleaning? Okay, three, four, five. Okay, so these are, the, we've seen all these fantastic robots in the movies, but in reality, this is the only thing we get in our, in our house, right? So there's a big gap, so what's happening? So all of this is about to change and there are lots and lots of companies now that are being formed uh, in artificial intelligence. Uh, there's a lot of money being invested increasingly. Billions of dollars being invested in artificial intelligence. Uh, it's moving, number of patents is growing in artificial intelligence. Uh, and um, this, this entire field is sort of is, uh, moving forward very quickly. Uh, may, maybe you've seen some of these uh, shows on TV that show how a computer can play Jeopardy and beat the world champion. Maybe you've seen, you've heard that a computer was able to beat the world champion in the, in the game of Go just a few months ago. That was a big, a big moment. These are high profile events where AI is sort of outperforming things we once thought were impossible for computers to do. But there's also other things coming down the, the, the pike that you should be aware of. For example, if you go to, a, a, if you go into a supermarket today, a grocery store, and you buy something, at the end, when you want to go out, you have to go to the cashier and you have to pay for what you bought, right? So in the future, you'll be able to walk into a supermarket, take whatever you want off the shelves, and walk out. You'll still pay, but your parents will pay. But uh, it will be an AI system that will watch what you took off the shelf and will charge will charge you for what you take out without having to go through a cashier. Uh, for example, if you have a spot on your skin and you're not sure if it's, uh, if it's a, just a regular thing or it's something that you need to see a doctor for, you will uh, 
you'll let your camera, your, your phone look at it, and the phone will decide if it's okay or not. In fact, the phone algorithms today can, do, can outperform what even a group of uh, uh, doctors can do. So, so this software is getting better even than the best doctors. Uh, and of course, what's this? Anybody recognize? It's a driverless car. This is a car with no driver. You just sit in there and the car takes you. These, uh, most of you will never learn how to drive. Isn't that amazing? You, will, you, you, can, you can learn how to drive for fun, for fun, but not because you need it, because you will be driven around uh, eventually uh, by uh, using these driverless cars, and this will happen sooner uh, than you think. All right, so let's, you asked what is artificial intelligence, so let me try to put a definition on it. So what, what is AI? It is really creating systems that think and act uh, like humans. That's really the only definition we have for artificial intelligence because it's a moving target. Every day that uh, AI can do something, uh, that's already sort of in the past, and we try to look what else can humans do that machines can't. That's the next goal for AI. So it used to be playing chess, it used to be uh, playing uh, all kinds of things, and uh, uh, it's uh, going to move forward uh, from there. How does the machine work for the market thing that they see, that they see what you took? Okay, so we'll talk about how it does it, but it can actually, there's a camera that, that watches everything, there's lots of cameras that watch everything, uh, all, the, uh, all the merchandise in the store, and they can understand what they're seeing. And this is, this is tricky because we humans, we, we understand what we see. But a computer can actually, uh, the new AI can actually understand that you're taking something off, that you're putting it in your bag, or that you're putting it back on the shelf. It can actually understand that, and it just watches and, and tallies up what you took and what you returned, and it charges you. When was artificial intelligence created? So here you can see one of the first examples of uh, a chess, uh, checkers playing machine yeah. from 1957. Uh, and that's, uh, that's an example of one of the first uh, cases of artificial intelligence that was created. And it's a machine that plays checkers. Okay, this is checkers. So this is 1957, already computers are playing checkers. And it's an example of a case where um, uh, where AI can do something that up until then it was thought that only humans can do. We'll take one more question and then we'll move on. My name is Eva and um, who programs these systems? Like, is there a special company that does it? Yeah, so okay, well actually I'll show you exactly how these machines are programmed. Uh, well, let's, so let me answer that, and then, we, then, uh, then we'll, we'll take more questions. So, so actually, this is a good example of ask, to answer both of your questions. When did it start, and how is it done? And we'll talk a little bit about how artificial intelligence actually works, uh, and, uh, and, and from the beginning to what it can do today. So this is an example. There's basically two ways in which you can make a machine be intelligent or appear to be intelligent or behave and act like a human. And I'm gonna show you two examples, but the basic idea is, uh, one idea is, is uh, by giving the computer rules, and the computer follows these rules uh, and appears to be intelligent. So it just follows the rules and, and, uh, and sort of uh, puts the rules together and it can do something interesting. For example, play checkers, and I'll show you an example in a moment. And the other approach to artificial intelligence, also invented more or less in the same time, 19, the late 1950s, right? So almost uh, 60 years ago, uh, is something we call machine learning. And I'm gonna talk about these two ideas. So one is you program a machine by giving it rules. Somebody tells the machine how to work with rules. And another approach is you show the machine how to work using examples. So for example, if you think about how you might uh, learn how to, uh, how to speak a language, how do you learn how to speak English, for example? So if you were, um, as a baby, if you learn how to speak, you learn by example. You hear your parents speak, you hear your siblings speak. So you listen to lots of examples of people speaking, and 
you learn how to speak, right? In the beginning, you can say a word or two. Gradually, you learn how to speak. Nobody teaches you grammar. Nobody explains to you what verbs are. Nobody explains to you what past tense is. You just learn from hearing people speak. That's the machine learning approach. That's equivalent to learning from example. When you are in school, you start learning a new language, and very often you learn using rules. Somebody will tell you, well, here's how you say apple, here's how you say this, here's how you conjugate verbs, here's how you use past tense, here are rules, here are exceptions, here are exceptions to the exceptions, and so on, right? So you get rules of how to learn. So these are, this are an example of, again, two ways of learning, of, of speaking. One is with rules, one is by learning from example. So I want to give you an illustration of how that actually works. What game is this? Tic-tac-toe. All right. So anybody here play, ever play tic-tac-toe? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you all know how to play this game. Let's see how we can teach a computer to play this game. All right. So this is not checkers or chess or go or driving a car, but it's something that requires a little bit of intelligence, right, to play it well. How can we play uh, this game? So let's, let's start thinking about... First, let's take the first approach, which is programming this thing with rules. If you had to make a computer play this game with rules, what would be the rules you would tell the computer uh, for deciding how to win this game? So if you, if you, if you can uh, give a computer tips for how to decide how to win this game, what would be a good, uh, a good thing to do? Anybody? Anybody have suggestions? Yeah? Start with the center circle. Okay, start, always start, if you can, start with the center. That's a great rule. Okay, that's a great rule. Anybody have other, other rules? You also fill in the corners. Okay, so I would say if you, can't get to the, if you can't get to the center, get to the corner, right? That's another great rule. Uh, let's have somebody who hasn't spoken yet. Okay, go ahead. You have to get as closest to winning as you can by uh, either you can do it straight or diagonally. Okay, so that's actually a great rule that we sort of take for granted. But yes, if, some, if there are two in a row, either diagonal, or horizontal, or uh, vertical, you want to, and the third place is empty, you want to put it there, right? So that's even rule number one before you do anything else. Anybody else can think of other rules? Yeah? So, we were so busy trying to make him play good that we didn't even put in the actual rules of tic-tac-toe. We only put in how to play tics. Right, right. So, so, um, so right now, the people that were evaluating programming doesn't really know how right. to play. That's right. So, we first. We first we teach it how to play what's, what's allowed and what's not allowed, but the real intelligence is not knowing just the rules, it's how, knowing how to win. So yeah, we're talking about only rules. But yeah, but if you don't program the rules, then it won't know how to play, and it, so it won't be able to play. Right, that's right, you need to do that first, that's right. <laughs> After you do that, then okay, so we'll tell you, this. so let's get one last rule here. And then we'll uh, see an alternative approach. I'm getting my work done. Yeah. <laughs> we could teach a, a computer to make moves that could obligate the other person to make him win in a sort of way. Yeah, so what you call, what you're talking about is, is called a fork. So you can put the position in a place that the opponent uh, has whatever they do. There's two ways of winning, so whatever they do, you do the opposite. That's called a fork and you can, you can sort of corner your opponent. All right, so you pretty much nailed all the rules that I could think of uh, on how to play a game of tic-tac-toe. So these are rules and this, we would take these rules, maybe we would prioritize them. Uh, first, complete any open row. If not, block opponent from completing a row. Nobody mentioned that. So if your opponent is about to complete a row, you want to put it in place. You want to create a fork if you can, otherwise play a center. If no center, play a corner position. And if no corner position, just play anything. This is a set of maybe six rules, and if a computer follows these rules, it can play, uh, it cannot be beaten. 
in tic-tac-toe. It can appear to be very, very smart. It's, it's just a set of six rules and we did it. So we can make a computer do this. But uh, this doesn't work for everything. If I uh, asked you, if I would ask you to write down the rules for chess, that would be a very long list and you probably still wouldn't work. Okay, well, great. So, but it's still, for most people, that's pretty, pretty difficult to do, yeah. Um, before you even program the rules, you actually have, have to make the real game. Yeah, you have to first tell the computer how to, just what, what's allowed, and then you have to tell it how, what are the rules are for winning. So that's an example of programming by rules, and this is the way people built artificial intelligence systems up until about the 90s. And they still do for many applications, but it only works when there are experts like yourselves who know the rules. But for many applications, nobody knows what the rules are. So people, you knew the rules for tic-tac-toe, but if I would ask you what are the rules for driving a car, for example, that's very, very hard to actually articulate all the rules. Uh, for merging into traffic and things like that. So we can articulate rules for certain things, but not for others. So what's the alternative? The alternative approach is something we call machine learning. And this is really the future of AI, and this is something, it's a term you should probably remember. Uh, the idea of machine learning, when people say machine, they mean computer, right? So it means computer learning. It means that the computer learns from example. Nobody sits down and writes rules. It just learns from examples. The idea is that the computer looks at lots and lots and lots of games. It looks at thousands or maybe even millions of games. And it begins to track which board configurations typically lead to a win and which board configurations typically lead to a loss. So it might figure out that if you do this, if you put your X here, there is maybe 80% chance you're gonna win and 10% uh, chance you're gonna lose and 10% chance you're gonna draw, just statistically. If you put your X in this situation, this is the board and you go here, there is 71% chance you're gonna win, 13% 13 chance, uh, 13 chance you're gonna lose and something else you're gonna draw. So you can just keep a, a long tally in a big file, a big database of all the possible things that you can do and watch the chance you're gonna win and watch the chance you're gonna lose. Now, how does it do that? It just looks at lots and lots of games. Where does it get these games from? It plays with, uh, with other people and you have other ideas? Yeah, it just looks at Maybe some people play on the internet right. against another person. So he... That's right. So you can look at games of people that play on the internet. But here's the best cool idea that a computer can learn. It can learn by playing against a copy of itself. It can play a gazillion games a second against a copy of itself. And it can amass a huge amount of experience. Now with tic-tac-toe, it's not a big deal. But with a game of chess or even a game of Go, it can play thousands and millions of games a second and have an incredible amount of experience which it can compress into a predictive model about which moves are gonna to lead to a win and which moves are gonna to lead to a loss. And this is the basic idea. So, so, this is, uh, so it accumulates these uh, experiences. So for the game of tic-tac-toe, there are 5,000 and some possible board configuration. So it's not a lot as far as computers uh, can uh, go. So this can be maybe 5,000 uh, cases. It goes through all of these and it tracks which one tend to lead to a win, which tend to lead to a loss, and it uses that to play, uh, to, to move. So when you see a computer playing tic-tac-toe, and this is just a example of some random robot playing tic-tac-toe, it can, it can use it can use that experience that it gained over time to figure out how to move forward. Okay, question. So at what point is technology considered artificial intelligence? Is it when the technology starts operating on its own or when the code makes itself or how does it work? What's the, the difference between what, my, like what Siri does and what 
my computer does on its own, what it tells me on its own? You know, that's, that's a great question. It's almost a marketing question. Uh, it's, so artificial intelligence is usually uh, something that we decide is on par with the human. So uh, right now, when a computer can, like Siri, can understand what you're saying, you think it's actually a pretty, it's, it's artificial intelligence. But in the future, all the computers will understand what you're saying, and it wouldn't be a big deal. You wouldn't think about it as, as AI anymore. So it's always sort of the, the latest thing that a computer can do, like a human, that it couldn't do before. OK? Yeah, there's a question there. So um, how long ago was um, artificial intelligence like started, like, when did we start making computers yeah. and machines do this? Okay, so this all started uh, around uh, 60 years ago. So I showed you uh, uh, this chess playing machine from, from checkers playing machine from 1957. So about six, or more or less exactly 60 years ago. But if you look at how fast computers are getting, you'll notice that computers are getting faster and faster uh, with time. So these are the years from 1900 all the way to 1950 to 2000 to 2010, and we're sort of here. And you can see that computers are getting faster and faster and faster. And I want to point out that this scale, uh, every, every tick here is 10 times faster than before. So you can see that every year or two, every decade, we get computers that are 10 times faster than they were before, which means that computers are getting faster and faster and faster. And remember, artificial intelligence, no matter if you're using machine learnings or rules, is riding these curves. If a computer is faster, the AI is also faster. And so what started in this way, uh, with very slow computers and very big machines, look at this huge computer that's playing, uh, playing checkers, that is uh, a lot less powerful than the machines you have today. So, but when we look at history, there's something very interesting. These two, these two schools of thought, these two approaches, the rule and the machine learning, fought with each other about which one is going to win. Some people said machine learning is the way to make computers smart. And some people said rules are the way to make people smart. And that was uh, the, uh, the the big challenge. In fact, back in 1957, somebody tried to write, uh, to teach a computer to tell the difference between a triangle, a circle, and a square. But not by writing rules, but just by showing it examples. This is a, a digital camera from 1957. They were showed a lot of examples of shapes, and the computer just uh, learned to do that. So up until the 1990s, People still believe that programming smart machines with rules is the way to make intelligent computers. So from the 50s all the way to the 90s, people thought that smart algorithms are always better than machine learning with data. But that began to flip around the 90s, before you were born. Uh, and computers started learning and learning. Um, exactly how long does it take to like What's the average amount of time it takes to make like a form of, a form of AI? Okay, so it depends on the problem. So to, uh, for an AI system to decide how to play the next move in tic-tac-toe, tic, tic, it, uh, it takes a nanosecond, like super fast. But for an AI system to look at a picture, decide if it's a cat or a dog, it takes it maybe a second, right? Okay. So I want to show you one example that I uh, really felt uh, myself where uh, some of these things didn't work. So I do a lot of work in robotics. And robotics is the one area where you can really see how writing rules uh, doesn't uh, actually work. So here's a robot, for example, that needs to learn how to move uh, between obstacles, negotiate obstacles. All right. So again, this is something that you can do very easily. A baby can do this, can walk around the house and not bump into things, right? So, so uh, but for a robot, that's a really, really difficult thing to do. So here's uh, an example of a robot that moves around and it can detect obstacles and move around them. So this was 1970s. People could do this, but it turned out 
that it worked only in the lab. And when they took these robots outside and into the real world and told them, okay, now you, can, you know how to avoid obstacles, why don't you drive along the road and stay on the road and don't bump into anything? Nobody could do it, no robot could do that. All the robots fell off the road. So what worked in the lab didn't work outside. And this is one of the challenges we have with AI systems that we can build rules that work in the lab and work in playing chess and checkers, but it's very difficult to build rules for the real world. So uh, if you fast forward another 30 years, from 1970s to 2005 or so, there was this big competition uh, in, the, in the US, uh, in the desert in, in, uh, in California, where they said, we're gonna give $2 million, the government said, give $2 million to anybody who can write software that would drive a car through the desert. $2 million. So lots of companies uh, signed up, lots of, uh, lots of uh, hackers and lots of universities and lots of companies, big and small, said, okay, we're gonna write software that can drive a car through the desert. They put the, the car, they put the software in the car, and they hit enter, and guess what happened? No car made it to the finish line. In fact, the best car could only drive seven miles out of the 150 miles of the race, and it fell into the ditch. All 100 cars fell into the ditch, all right? That's how bad it was. So, so we can play chess and we can play checkers, but no software could drive a car just a few years ago. Uh, I remember our, the car from uh, Cornell University, where I was at the time, uh, was uh, uh, driving and it reached this, uh, uh, it reached an overpass. And then it uh, didn't know what to do because there was no rule that said you can go under the overpass. Okay, nobody thought of putting in a rule that said if there's an, some objects you can go underneath. Nobody thought of putting that rule in there. So the car stopped there and didn't know what to do. But there was one, there was a few groups that uh, in 2005, when the competition happened again, were able to win. Uh, and uh, the team lead for one of these uh, teams said, in the end, we started relying on what we call machine learning or big data. That is, instead of trying to program all these rules by hand, we taught a robot the same way we would teach a human driver. In other words, they drove the car around and they showed the car how to drive. They showed it good driving, bad driving. They showed it. They gave an example. And then they, they let the car drive on its own. And they gave it, uh, they yelled at it if it didn't drive correctly. And they patted it on the back when it did drive correctly and it used all that data to figure out how to drive on its own, very much uh, in the same way that, uh, that it learns how to play tic-tac-toe. So this is uh, sort of one of the reasons why we're beginning to see uh, these vehicles that can start uh, uh, learning how to drive and all. It's because they are learning instead of being programmed by rules and that's a big change from the past. So to sum things up, when you uh, think about machine learning and all this new age of AI, you have to remember that there are two things happening. Today's artificial intelligence is based on machine learning algorithms, and it's based on data that trains these systems and learn, helps them learn how to do stuff. And we like to uh, compare the data to fuel and the algorithm to the engine. And they're both useless on their own, but when they come together, this is when the whole thing, thing takes off, and this is what's happening now. Thank you. <laughs> right, so there are more questions there. So you said that, uh, like, basically at the first part of the slideshow, you said that um, driverless cars didn't exist, but doesn't Tesla have a car that like can drive itself? Right, so driverless cars are beginning to show up. These are relatively new, uh, and they are based entirely on this new technology of machine learning. That's exactly, and they're, you know, their they're, they're Tesla cars don't 
drive themselves 100% of the time, but probably by the time uh, you would learn to drive, they would drive themselves 100% of the time, so you don't need to. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So um, can, like, in the future, can the um, artificial, artificial intelligence, like, start to be in some way dangerous for, like, human beings? Because the robots are getting smarter and smarter. Every, like, yeah, so um, sometimes, like, people will lose their jobs and, like, how, like, how... Yeah, that's a great question that uh, even grown-ups don't ask. So, uh, so, so, so absolutely, these are, these are two great questions. So is this a dangerous technology? So this is definitely powerful technology. It sort of uh, can do a lot of things. And people can do, you know, it can be used for, for good and for bad. So I like to think that the real, first of all, there's a lot of benefit from this technology that it can help us, for example, eliminate traffic accidents because cars will drive more safely than humans. So it's a good thing. But there is a dangerous element, it's a great question, and the danger is more sort of how people will use this, what people will do to people with this technology. So can people use this to make bad things? And that's really the risk. It's not so much that the machines will rise and, and evil machines will suddenly take over the world. The, the risk more is that evil people will start using this technology to do bad things, and this is, Part of why I want you all to know how this technology works, so you can make sure that this doesn't happen. But there is a question about jobs. That's another question that you asked, an even more grown-up question. And that uh, is difficult to answer. So there are, uh, there are certain jobs that this technology takes away, and there are certain jobs that this technology doesn't take away. And it's important to understand which jobs are which. Uh, so when you go to college, you can start thinking about what the world will look like maybe 20 years from now so that you can prepare. And that's a much longer discussion of what, uh, what uh, technologies are, are good to know and, and what not, but that's, that's a, good, a great question. So um, how much can we depend on the um, cars that drive by themselves now, and how much do you think that we could depend on these cars in, let's say, 20 years? Great, so the great question. So right now, I would say cars that drive themselves uh, are close to the same performance as a human driver. But that's not good enough. Uh, I think, uh, you know, in, in, because you saw that, that unlike people, computers keep learning faster and faster and faster, in a few years, driverless cars will be much, much safer than, uh, than people drive. So I would say in about five years, they'll be uh, two times safer than the average driver, at which point it would make no sense to drive your own car. It would be a lot safer to, uh, to drive in a, in a car that drives itself uh, and so forth. So one of, the, one of the things that I think is important, when you go and buy your car uh, 20 years from now, uh, you will probably go to a car lot and there will be a sticker on every car and says, this car drives 10 times safer than a human driver. This car drives 15 times safer than a human driver. This car drives 21 times safer, but it costs another $10,000. And then you'll have to think about, do you want to pay more for a safer car or not, all right? But this is how it's going to be. It's definitely going to be safer than a human, human driver, no doubt about it. Let's take somebody who has not spoken yet. Yeah? Do artificial machines swim in water? Wait, ask that again? Do they swim in water? Uh, there are uh, submarines that have artificial intelligence in them that can go far and deep. And in fact, when it comes to submarines, it's actually very useful because it's dangerous to have people in a submarine. And, it's, and also, you can, it's very difficult to communicate to a submarine in the ocean. You can't, there's no wireless communication to a submarine. So because of that, the submarine needs to make decisions on its own, and artificial intelligence is very useful. Great question. I, I have a comment. My dad, um, well, I overheard him. Um, he said that 
Um, there was a car going down um, the street uh, next to my country house, <laughs> and it had no driver. So maybe um, it was like part of the contest or something. Uh, was that recently? Um, I think I heard it one year ago. Uh, I think, uh, well, today it's not legal for cars to not have anybody in them. It was only legal in that contest in the desert. So unless you were driving in the desert, was it in the desert? <laughs> the country house is not in the desert. All right, so, so uh, it's probably uh, there was somebody in there. They were just uh, kind of invisible. What, what kind of programming do you write to make the computer teach itself? Uh, so a lot, it's actually very, very simple. It's a great question. What software do you need? And uh, So just like this tic-tac-toe, it's actually very easy. You can write, once you, you can, you can uh, write in any software, in Python, in, in uh, whatever, in Java, whatever language you like, you can make the computer play lots of games against itself and keep track of what typically leads to a win, what typically leads to a loss, and then it can use that. But also, increasingly, probably not at your level yet, but all the big companies, the Googles, the Apple, Amazon, Facebook, they all have open source software for machine learning. So even if you don't want to write the software, you can download these tools and you can say, here are all my examples, learn from it, and it will learn. So you can say, for example, here are lots of examples of uh, cats and lots of examples of dogs, and the machine will learn to tell the difference between a cat and a dog from a camera without you needing to do anything. I saw one farmer that said, here are pictures of all my 100 cows, Linda, Barbara, all 100 cows, and the computer learned to tell the difference between them, and now the computer can tell them this cow is not eating today as much as it usually does. It can recognize everything. So you don't need actually to program a lot. You can sort of download the software. But you need to provide the data. The data always comes from the user. Do you think that um, the people who like, make these systems will be able to make other like, motorcycles move by themselves later? Like, in Oh, so, so driverless motorcycles? That's a really interesting, uh, I haven't thought about that. Rockets, maybe? Yeah, so rockets are pretty much uh, drive themselves already. Um, boats and airplanes can drive themselves a long time ago. Cars is, are really hard. And, uh, um, you know, motorcycles? I don't know. That's a really, that's a, that's a good one. How can you make a... A car that drives on its own, like, make it learn to go faster when it's an uphill and slower if it's a downhill? Faster when it's uphill. Uh, it actually it's usually drives at the same speed. So if it sees that it's, it's uphill and it's slowing down because it's more difficult, it would sort of hit, press the gas pedal a little bit more. So you can sort of, you can, for that you can write a rule or you can show it as an example. Do you think the astronauts will lose their jobs? Uh, astronauts? I don't know, probably. But there's only like uh, three of them, so. <laughs> but uh, but that's, who asked that question? I didn't see. Yeah, so, but it is, if you're going to Mars or to Pluto, you can only send uh, robots anyway. Right, so what's the point of sending people there? Can like, he, like can humans still drive? Will it be like illegal? Um, I think it will be, humans will have like a plastic steering wheel, you know, like, a, like you see sometimes in a supermarket, you can pretend to drive. So they will have this plastic steering wheel and they will pretend to drive, but really it'll be the computer driving. Uh, I'm Lucia. I was wondering, so can you make than AI that is rules and machine learning? Fantastic question, can you combine? Yeah, so absolutely there are, for example, driving is a great example. So 
There are certain things that you teach the AI with examples, like to tell the difference between a child and a fire hydrant, all right? That's, you, that's difficult to, to do with rules, but you give the computer examples. But then there are certain things, like when it's red, stop, and when it's green, go, that you can, you can write a rule for. So absolutely, so when you talk about driverless cars, it's actually a hybrid system that has a few rules and also learns from examples, and that's, how, that's really how it's made. That's a great question. So how will artificial intelligence affect weapons? And if it does, will war be more dangerous? Or, or will, like, um, will terrorist attacks kind of like have a different approach? Yeah, so, so again, it's, 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 you're touching on the sort of the, the dark side of AI is that people can misuse it, exactly like you say. But when it comes to war, I think maybe something will happen where we'll have robots fighting robots. Isn't that awesome? No people, just robots fighting robots, and it will, it will be on the moon maybe, uh, and that will be great, yeah. How fast can a car drive? A computer, uh, so a driverless car right now is So right now, cars, uh, driverless cars are bound by the same speed limits as regular cars. So they, can, they only drive uh, 60 or 70 miles an hour or slower if they're in, in a city. But if you're asking how fast could they potentially drive, then they could probably drive a lot faster than humans safely. So they can drive maybe 100 miles an hour pretty easily. So I think, again, when you grow up, you'll be sleeping in the back of a driverless car that's going 100 miles an hour quite uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Would some police lose their job because you know how like some, pe some people that are driving like over the speed limit or like drunk driving, would, they, would police lose their job because now they can't pull them over? Yes, actually you're absolutely right. That's actually fantastic, uh, something that most people don't see. Uh, yes, a lot of policemen will not have a job because there'll be nobody to give tickets to. Nobody to arrest. It's quite amazing. Do you know how many, how, what percentage of people in jail are because of bad driving? Seven percent. Seven. So all these people will not be in jail anymore. How many people, do you know how much uh, money New York gets from tickets? Half a billion dollars a year. That's going to go half a billion dollars. A lot of people walking around giving tickets and that won't be happening anymore. That's a great question. So it's, it's bad for some people, but it's good for everybody else. All right, thank you very much.